Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 245, recorded on June 14th, 2022. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. We start this week with two old favorites getting together. The Thunderbird Project has announced that the K9 Mail app is not only joining the project, but will ultimately transform into Thunderbird for Android. Yeah, this has been in the works for some time, but it's only now becoming public as Christian Ketter is joining MZLA Technologies, that's the home to Thunderbird, as a full-time staffer as of June 1st. This acquihire really kind of underscores how much things have changed for Thunderbird. On the ropes, really just a few years ago, almost shut down by Mozilla, it's now no longer part of the foundation but not just standing on its own, it's thriving. We'll probably get some more details published publicly soon, but I had a chance to chat with Ryan Sipes earlier today. He's the product and business developer manager for Thunderbird, and he informs me that Thunderbird's in a much better place these days, saying that nearly $3.5 million in revenue has been achieved, with 99.9% of that coming from donations by the users. And that's given them the ability to staff up to just over 20 people with the bandwidth to execute on plans. And using some of that prosperity to make an acquihire like Christian Kidder makes good sense. I mean, was it ever going to be practical to port Thunderbird to Android, at least anytime soon? Plus, you're going to have to compete with K9 itself, which is doing a great job. This way, they get to work together. Plus, I mean, there's got to be some long-term benefits from having Christian on staff as well. Yeah, that all makes sense, too. And I kind of get the sense that perhaps Christian was reaching the end of his runway with K9. It is a massive, massive project to take on for one developer. When you consider you have to run a business, you have to provide support, you have to deal with the Google Play Store and users and then actually find time to develop. (laughs) So I think it makes sense. So it seems like a nice, straightforward fit for everyone. But where I don't see things fitting so well is the different user bases of Thunderbird and K9. I mean, I think it's probably reasonable to assume that both user bases have probably found their current mail app after trying either the default on their platform or another email app that they just didn't like. So maybe they're a little more particular about the way things work with their email app than your average user. And that seems like it's going to be a tricky thing for Thunderbird to balance and get just right going forward. So I asked Ryan just about that very thing. Sure. It's it's not easy. And it is, like you said, it, 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 it is balancing. It's a balancing act in that mobile and desktop are not the same devices. They're not the same size. They don't work the same. It's it's a very different experience. And, and user expectations are different there. But I feel like K9 was the best reflection of like what a Thunderbird experience on mobile would look like. And at our core, our values were exactly the same. And that was, you know, the values of open standards and open source, re- respecting the user and enabling power users with, you know, customization and, and, and the ability to control their workflows. And so I think that if we continue to carry those values into what we work on, on both sides, I think that our users are enough alike in those respects that they'll be happy with the outcome. And then the practical side of that is since Ketty came on, we've been kind of doing a little bit of a cultural exchange. I've been talking a lot and various team members on our side have been talking a lot to canine male users to better understand their wants and needs. And he's been talking to um, quite a few of our users. and, And so in that way, we're trying to trying to see where the similarities are and where the differences are and and try to accommodate those. I suppose time will tell, but I'd say that sounds like a pretty good mindset going into things. We also got the sense from Ryan that a couple of big desktop releases are in the works for Thunderbird as well. So we'll be keeping an eye out for that. Well, those of us still wanting to build a RISC-V desktop or server one day will be happy to hear that Ubuntu is hard at work at bringing up and improving support for the Star 5 Vision 5 RISC-V board. Michael Larable over at Pharonix calls the $179 device, quote, one of the most promising low-cost RISC-V single-board computers to date intended to run full-blown RISC-V Linux distributions. And you know what? 
we got to agree with him on that. The board comes in two varieties with 4 gigs or 8 gigs of system memory, powered by a dual core Sci 5 U74 RV64 SoC clocked at 1 gigahertz. But it's also got an NVDLA deep learning accelerator, a 10 silica VP6 Vision DSP, and oh yeah, a neural network engine. Woo, yeah, okay. I mean, I'm not blown away by the 1 gigahertz clock speed of the main CPU. But you do got to start somewhere, and they move more and more functionality off under these dedicated coprocessors. That performance story starts getting a little more complicated. And keeping the price down means that these boards get into the hands of more developers. So that seems like a good thing. And of course, it means Ubuntu developers can work on enabling their Star 5 vision boards and getting their Risk 5 kernel builds working on those boards. And that's going to mean more Risk hardware for everybody. Because apparently there are always more clouds that need more operating systems. This week, the Fedora Engineering and Steering Committee decided to relist their cloud spin as an official Fedora edition. Interestingly, this change was led by an Amazon AWS engineer who's also a Fedora contributor. His name is David Duncan. In his proposal, Duncan wrote, quote, Cloud should be listed on getfedora.org, along with workstation, server, and IoT. The petition to reinstate the cloud base as an official addition is based on the clear identification of unique environmental support requirements for both private hyperscalers as well as public cloud environments that are not specifically addressed by other additions. Currently, Fedora Cloud is listed as an alternative download and not the same level as other editions like Workstation or Server. Fedora Cloud base images are produced in a raw image form. So you've got builds for OpenStack, VirtualBox, and KVM images for Google Cloud Platform, AWS, of course, and others. So this proposal was looked at and received unanimous approval and will go into effect for Fedora 37 this fall, assuming everything goes as planned. Plasma 5.25 has just been released. This latest version brings new features, of course, but also new workflow concepts to the desktop environment. This is a big one, guys. There's been a lot of focus on gestures this release for the trackpads and for touchscreens, which look particularly great. And then visually, they've reworked the overview effect, so it's much cleaner and modern looking. And they've added this neat ability to sync your desktop accent colors with your wallpaper. Yeah, that makes for definitely subtle, but a nice effect that kind of ties your whole desktop together. And if you happen to use the slideshow as your wallpaper, the colors will update when the wallpaper changes. That's just a nice touch. 525 also makes some smart adjustments automatically when you invoke touch mode. For example, the task manager and the system tray become just a little bit bigger, and the title bars of KDE applications become taller. And they have this new floating panel mode, which looks so cool. And longtime Plasma users, you're going to want to check out the new rewritten KWIN script settings page. You're going to like it. And you'll probably also enjoy the new keyboard navigation options for Plasma panels. Of course, I'm still trying it all out. I've got it installed right now on my KDE Neon Box. We wanted to take a moment to make sure you're aware that one of our favorite tools had an update this week. That tool, well, it's Ventoy. If you're not familiar, then you must not be listening to Linux Unplugged, but Ventoy is a popular bootable USB utility that makes it easy to store multiple different ISOs and then choose which one to boot right on the fly. Version 1.0.76 now supports secure boot by default including a much improved ability to enroll secure boot keys. Along with that important update, though, they've also added additional ISO support, which brings the total supported number over 900. Plus, there's bug fixes, small improvements, the usual. We'll have a link in the show notes if you're still not using Ventoy. Linode.com slash LAN. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account, and you go there to support this year's show. Linode is really how we make all of the things that we pull off online possible, and you should too. It's fast, it's reliable, they've been doing this for nearly 19 years. Go try them out. Go see what I've been talking about. Go put that $100 to use. 
They've really been focused at making the best platform to run applications on Linux for almost 20 years. That's led to the best-in-class experience and why we host everything on Linode. You combine the stability, the performance, the support, the selections. They're always deploying the latest Linux distributions if that's what you like to do. Or, of course, they have the classics like you might expect, like your Almas and your Rockies. One thing that I like to try is just go to their marketplace from time to time and see what their apps are for the one-click deployment because they're often adding new stuff. And there's always things on the back end you could take advantage of or or not, depending on how complicated you want. Things like VLAN support, DDoS protection, a powerful DNS manager, and they have super fast networking. They are their own ISP. And with prices 30 to 50% cheaper than the major cloud providers out there, you get a great deal too with great service. And as I record, There's still about 17 days to create an open source project and win some serious prizes from Linode. They're partnering with Hashnode. They have a hackathon running from June 1st to June 30th. Grand prizes, there'll be runner-up prizes, swag, and you'll even just get something for participating. And I'm talking cash prizes. So go check out Linode's Twitter account for details on that. But first, go to linode.com slash LAN. Support the show and get that $100 on a new account and really kick the tires. It's linode.com slash LAN. We end this week with Adobe, which has recently announced its plans to make Photoshop on the web free for everyone. Now, right now, the company's testing this free version in Canada, where users can access Photoshop on the web with a free account. Adobe describes the service as, quote, freemium, and eventually plans to gate off some features that will be exclusive to paying subscribers, because of course they will. But they do say that enough tools will be freely available to perform what they consider Photoshop's, quote, core functions. So I guess this is technically Photoshop coming to Linux eventually. Um, And maybe we always kind of figured it would go this way, but, you know, it still struck me as funny, Wes. Uh, This just feels like yet another example where for decades we pined as a Linux community to have somebody bring their application to Linux. And then when that finally arrives, it's never quite how we pictured it was going to be. You know, it's always kind of a little bit different. Like if I wanted Photoshop on the web, I'd just use PhotoP at PhotoP.com like right now. Um, We've arrived in the future where I thought we'd have all these native apps and what we have is a bunch of web apps. Yeah, I mean, what? 10, 15 years ago, Chris, you know, Linux, Linux desktop hopefuls, probably hoping for some sort of like native cute thing, you know, it felt like it was home on the Linux desktop. It was all the same logic, full functionality, just like a, a native first class Linux version. And instead, I mean, yes, we've watched the rise of web apps more generally, but we've also seen the rise of Electron and companies deciding that that's the target they're going to adopt to go multi-platform. And at the same time, we've sort of seen the success of Wine, which has kind of hedged off in the same direction, right? Now we're clamoring less for some of these applications because whether it's Wine directly or now that we've got Proton, there's a compatibility shim we can apply and it's kind of just good enough. So I don't don't know if I'm disappointed or just realistic, but it's, it's kind of wild in how many different domains this has happened from, you know, from the modern version of Outlook for Office 365 Almost everything's on the web these days, and I guess that means the operating system is just a lot less important, at least as long as it runs Chrome. Yeah, maybe that's part of what I'm feeling here, a little bit of that. But then there's the like the practical side, like you say, um, people who need Photoshop on Linux that would like to use Linux, they now will, I mean, they're going to have an option for the first time that's actual real Photoshop. That's That's kind of incredible because I know I have been multiple times in the position of needing to get Photoshop going under Wine just because somebody sent me a Photoshop file that maybe we contracted with or, you know, I'm going to go open up some legacy show art and that's in a Photoshop file format. And, you know, the whole rigmarole of trying to get that working under Wine, trying to get the right version, do I have the ability to license it, that kind of stuff. It'd be nice just to see all that go away. So a free version is a good thing. It means more people have access to this. and. It also, it's worth mentioning that this has historically been like a very expensive application. Photoshop alone used to be over a grand, then they locked it behind the Creative Cloud membership. And the other factor is, the other real practical thing that you kind of made me think about here is, 
for most people, the, the core functionality is probably enough. The free functionality is probably going to be enough. Ah, you're right. I mean, does that, does that hurt the use case for some of our, our favorite tools like GIMP? You know, the things that were kind of meeting that low common denominator baseline, but now it's, now it's just another web SaaS that you're going to use instead. Maybe. I don't know. Or, or do people really prefer native apps? Or perhaps because it took Adobe so long to bring Photoshop to Linux, maybe things like GIMP have enough of an established user base that they don't have to worry now? It's possible. I do also wonder if we're going to see this continue with the rest of the suite. You know, kind of, kind of as you mentioned, because it's been so long, we just still haven't gotten Photoshop, whether it's PhotoP or GIMP or other, other tools or whole virtual machines, folks have come up with workarounds. But... If this ends up being the whole creative suite that's easy to access online, that might be hard to resist. True. Wouldn't that be something? After Effects in a web browser. And you could see it going that way. Companies have limited resources, limited time, even rich companies. And this is just clearly a easy, honestly, very available, like both in skill set and in technology. It's very easy and available to do this kind of web app development now, and it just gives you cross-app, cross-device, cross-platform compatibility just out of the box. So, yeah, I think you're right, Wes. I think we're going to see a lot more things go this way. Maybe one day the entire creative suite. Let us know what you think out there. And whichever way it goes, native applications, web applications, or no applications at all, we'll let you know. Just go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get new episodes. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact to let us know why Adobe should probably be using Flutter. <laughs> That's right. And of course, you can support this show and all the network shows and get them ad free by going to jupiter.party and becoming a member. As for this show, well, don't worry. We'll be back next week with our take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. And that's all the news for this week. <laughs>